All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome. I'm Chris Jones. I'm with the University of Arizona Gila County Cooperative Extension. This is our Garden and Country Extension webinar series. Um, today, the presentation is called The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. It's about bugs in the garden. Our speaker is Susan Miller Hoover, who is a staff member at the uh, Payson Community Garden. I'm sure she can tell you more about herself when we get started. Um, just a little bit about these webinars. They're a weekly Zoom webinar, 60 minutes or less, Thursdays at 11. They feature a variety of horticultural and natural resources topics relevant to the environmental conditions and residential concerns of Gila County. And of course, these things are important to people outside of Gila County, but you know, I'm setting it up. This is my service area. Uh, a recording will be posted at this website, extension.arizona.edu slash Gila. Uh, you'll look for the Garden and Country Extension um, webpage and got several of the past presentations already on there and the list of upcoming presentations. So please find that, bookmark it, and that'll keep you up to date with what I'm up to here. Um, the University of Arizona is an equal opportunity affirmative action institution. Our agenda here today, thank you for everybody, got on um, early um, at right here at 11. I, I'm doing our welcome. I'm Chris Jones, your moderator. Here in just a couple of minutes or, or less, um, Suzanne Miller is going to start with the good, the bad, and the ugly, bugs in the garden. Um, when she finishes up, I may provide a few updates. I have an evaluation link. Um, I'll put that into the chat box. Please open it. It only takes you about two minutes to fill out, probably less. And what I really appreciate is when you give ideas of what else you'd like to listen to. If you went on early, Susan and I were talking about the class and then the, the webinars. And so getting your ideas of what you're interested in gives me ideas for who to invite and keep, keep this up every week. Um, we'll have a, a Q and A discussion with uh, Suzanne. So while we're going through the talk, go ahead and put your questions into the chat box. Um, and then I'll be able to open your microphone and I'll just go through that list and we'll ask those questions. Um, we may have some time for open discussion, but I really seek to wrap up by noon so we can all get to lunch. I know I'm getting hungry. <laughs> all right, here's our speaker. Um, Susan gave her, uh, her biography to me, but she basically said she's a staff on the Payson Community Garden, so she can tell you more of her details on that. And so this is it. Susan, I'm going to um, close this, and now you can open the, the share screen as we practiced, and the, the, okay. the ball's in your court. I don't know if I can handle it, Chris. There it is. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm Susan Miller Hoover. Um, I started at the Payson Garden three years ago and came on staff a year ago. And I keep learning more and more as I go along. And I figure if I need to know anybody else. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, the bugs and why we have bugs in our garden and one thing that is different between a home garden and a community garden is that in the community garden as you can see from the picture that's on your screen the gardens are very close together so if something gets into my garden and then looks over at your garden and decides that it looks better it's going to jump over to your garden so we try to control the bugs from the very beginning so that um, they don't spread all over the garden. So we're going to talk about um, the good bugs, which are beneficial bugs that pollinate your garden and they target the bad bugs. We're also going to talk about the non-beneficial bugs that destroy or sicken your plants and what to do about it. And the ugly, 
for me is squash bugs and tomato horned worms. I cannot get past those things, and I think it's because they're so squishy. So let's talk about the good and the sometimes ugly bugs. The first thing that I want to talk about is prevention. Prevention is key in keeping these bugs away from your garden. So you want to make sure that you have healthy soil and healthy plants because they don't attract the bugs that um, are looking for the weaker plants to get on. The other thing that you can do, and if you've ever been to the community garden, you'll see people planting um, flowers that smell and that they repel the insects. So you can use catnip, lavender, lemongrass. We use a lot of basil, a lot of marigolds. Um, not so much mint in the gardens that we have just because it's so invasive, but we sometimes that on uh, in pots in our gardens and the garlic. So if you have room to plant some of these things in your garden, um, you'll be able to chase some of the bugs away. So the first beneficial bugs I want to talk about are, are bees. And there's two types. We have the honeybee and then we have the orchard mason bee. And the difference is that bees have four wings where flies only have two. And um, the wasps are generally less hairy than the bees are. And so you really want the bees in there to start pollinating all of your fruits and vegetables. And one of the ways that we encourage um, the orchard mason bees is to put up these um, cavity nesting boxes and we have several in our in our garden and they're dry hollow tubes that the bees go in and make their nests and the mason bees are not as attracted to people as the honeybees are so we're really trying to encourage them one that we have in our garden we followed the instructions. We put it up five feet, six feet, whatever it said, and we faced it towards the southeast. And then we put bees in it and they left. For some reason, they didn't like our bee house. But yet, on one of the other gardens in the back, she has it sitting nearly on the ground and facing in an entirely different direction and she has a ton of bees nesting. So um, you can't always follow the instructions, you're just going to have to play around with the placement for this, but um, they do attract the bees. The other one bug that you really want to have around is, or excuse me, is ladybugs. And some of our gardeners will bring in ladybugs at the beginning of the season when there are aphids and other bugs around um, because we want them to eat the aphids. We want them to snack on anything that they want to snack on. Um, they are best known as the beneficial predatory insect and they're usually most active from late spring to early fall, as long as you have food available. If there's nothing there for them to eat, they are going to go someplace else. So hopefully, if you have bugs, you have ladybugs. And this is just a picture of the ladybug larva on the left, so that you can recognize it. And then ladybugs feeding on whatever insect might be on this artichoke. So you don't want to get rid of these, you want to encourage them. There's a bug called the Mexican bean beetle that looks very similar to the ladybug, but it's orange. And the 
ladybug, bright red with black spots, eat your bugs, and the Mexican bean beetle is one of those non-beneficial bugs that tend to eat your plants. So if you see the one on the right that's orange with black spots, you want to get rid of that. And then there's a variety of spiders that are beneficial that eat the bugs and the insects. This one happens to be called the spider with the bright face. And his genus is, oh, Ar Argiope, I think is how you say it. And it just means that he has a bright face. So if you see this spider in your garden, don't get rid of it, leave it there. And this is one of the ugly bugs that I have a really hard time leaving in my garden because I don't like spiders. So I'm learning to share my garden space with them. Another great beneficial bug to have in your garden is the praying mantis. These guys have a ferocious appetite um, for eating aphids, leaf hoppers, mosquitoes, caterpillars, and any other soft bodied insect that you have. And you can bring them into the garden. One of our gardeners um, brought several praying mantis cocoons in and put them on our apple trees so that we would have praying mantis. And if you look, it's, my garden is right up front where these trees are. And I have little praying mantis all through my garden. So they hatched and they're doing their thing and hopefully next year we'll have just as many. This hummingbird moth, um, you'll definitely recognize because it is a really big moth and it does have the um, nose that goes into the flowers and pollinates for us. So everybody thinks, yay, let's keep these guys around. Well, that would be okay if they didn't turn into tomato hornworms. So this is a picture of the adult hummingbird moth that you want in your garden so that it pollinates. Then she's going to lay these little green eggs that you see on the leaf. And it's usually underneath on your, your tomato plant. And quite frankly, I've never been able to find a egg on my tomato plants, but I certainly do see these tomato worms. And they can destroy your tomatoes in a day. If you've got enough of them, they just eat all the leaves and they blend in so well that you, if you look for their droppings on the leaves below, you know you have a tomato worm someplace. And usually in the morning when it's cool, they're out on top where you can see them. But in the afternoon when it gets hot, they go deeper into your tomato plant. The other thing that's kind of fun about these guys are they glow with black light. So if you go out in your garden in the evening after the sun goes down with a black light, you would be amazed at how many um, bugs and things that you can find that you couldn't see during the day. And this worm is one of them. And then after he's eaten his fill, he goes down into the ground and becomes this ugly looking brown pupa that the picture is there. And so a lot of gardeners, if they see this, they immediately take those out and destroy them because they don't want the horned worm coming back in the spring. But it's kind of a catch-22 because you want the pollinator. But there's plenty of other pollinators. And if we could stop the cycle at any one of these points, then we wouldn't have as many horned worms on our tomato plants. 
the bad and sometimes ugly. So I'm going to concentrate a lot more on um, the bad bugs because they're the ones that we need to do something about. And the biggest thing I want to caution you guys about is don't make a pesticide, even if it's an organic pesticide, your first choice for killing bugs because you're going to kill the beneficial bugs too. So we want to try and be more discriminatory in our bugs. But if you get a bad infestation, sometimes the only recourse is to pull the plant or to use a bug spray. So all of you have probably seen aphids. They come in different colors. Um, the one thing about aphids is they tend to um, infest the plants that are post-ripe. So your kales, your cabbages, your lettuces, and things like that, that have gotten past their prime. So if you see aphids, and your spring garden is um, done, pull those plants, get them out of there, um, because otherwise they're just going to pierce your tender leaves on your good plants and suck out all of their juices. The other thing that's a sure sign, if you look at the middle picture, um, you see how that leaf is curled? As you continue to uncurl that, it's going to be full of aphids. So it's a sure sign that you have aphids if you've got a leaf that is rolled up. Um, so you want to get rid of those as soon as you can. And most of the time it's by get, getting more beneficial bugs in like the um, ladybug or by pulling these plants and leaves and getting rid of them. This little bug has been my nemesis this year. Um, when you plant potatoes, the Colorado potato beetle will eat the leaves. Um, and most of it is the larva and the nymphs that are doing it. Your adult beetle that you see over on the left side that has an orange head and a striped body um, overwinters in your garden. And so we used to think that if we covered our potato plants really well and made sure that there was no way for a bug to get into it, we wouldn't have potato bugs. But we have since learned the hard way that you cover up your potato plant, you cover up the um, beetle, and when you uncover it, you have these plants that have their leaves decimated, and you have these orange looking critters with black dots along their sides have devoured your plant. So you want to be really vigilant, and so what we do is if I see an adult, I pluck him off and throw him in a jar of soapy water because most bugs that I know of can't swim. And then I start looking under the leaves of the potato plant because these eggs are neon yellow. You can't miss them. And you can either, if you're into squishing them, they're soft enough that they can be squished and destroyed, or I just pull the whole leaf off and throw it in my jar of soapy water. And if you don't get rid of all the eggs, um, I was away from my garden for about a week and a half, and so hadn't been down there every day or every other day looking for these things. I ended up with a bunch of the nymphs and the larvae. And so I've been pulling those off and throwing them also into soapy water. And like the tomato hornworm, they leave their droppings on the leaves that are below. So you know you have something going on um, if you see the black droppings. And these bugs can 
just totally destroy all the leaves on your potato plant. One of my fellow gardeners, I picked a bunch of off for her because she lives in Young and doesn't get down to the garden as often as she would like. And there was no leaves left on her potato plant. So these guys require a lot of diligence to um, find them in the adult stage and get rid of them because one female can lay 100,000 eggs over four or five weeks. So you really want to get rid of them because you won't have any plants because they like to chew on tomatoes too. And squash bugs, you can't hardly plant a squash without having these guys um, come on board. Again, the adult, which is on your far left, um, winters over ground, uh, over winters underground, and they come up in the spring as soon as you start planting your seedlings. And you will see them mating. And then once they mate, the female will lay her egg mass, which is the middle picture, underneath a leaf. And these are really hard little eggs. So a piece of duct tape that you put over it and put some pressure on it will remove those eggs. And so you want to do that, or like I do, I remove leaves. I just don't want to mess around with it. And the picture on the right, the little spidery looking things, those are newly hatched um, squash bugs. And they travel in groups. And within a day or so, they become the young ones that are starting to look like the, um, like the adult bugs. But they go, once they get big enough, they just spread out all over the place. And they are extremely hard to get rid of. There's a couple of organic substances that actually kill the egg mass and the um, newly hatched. Um, squash bugs almost immediately. The adults take a couple of days um, and it's called Endol and I think the majority of the gardeners have a spray bottle of it in and around their gardens. I haven't had to use it yet this year because I didn't plant squash and I haven't seen any. The other thing about these bugs is you won't necessarily see them in the morning. So you want to water your squash and then they come out. And then you can catch them. They're fast, but you can catch them and get them into the, um, in the soapy water. Some people put out a board in the evening and the, squash bugs will go underneath that board. And in the morning, you turn it over and they're all congregated there and you can kill them in mass if that's what you want to do. But these guys can get out of hand really, really quickly. And the cabbage loper, this little guy is kind of cute looking, but he can do a lot of damage. He goes from the size on the left side that is just a couple of um, centimeters long to a three or four um, inch worm. And as you see the damage that he can do, he just starts eating on your cage, leaving big holes. And even the condensed head is not um, free from these bugs. What you can do to prevent them is put a um, floating row cover over them so that the um, eggs can't be laid and uh, or just pick them off and throw them in your jar of soapy water. 
the other thing to do is if you've got a lot of garden debris um, in your um, garden, that gives them a place to hide. So you want to make sure that your garden is as clean as it can be to keep these guys from um, getting onto your plants. Harlequin bugs. These bugs you're going to find in mass on your more sickly plants or the ones that have gone past a true good harvest time. And they lay their eggs and the larvae on the right hand side is what comes out of the eggs. And then the harlequin bugs are just these black with brilliant orange markings on them. And they usually are in mass on your, um, your vegetables. So again, to prevent these guys, uh, get your fruit, get your vegetables out of the garden when they're past their prime. Waiting for them another week just to see if you get any more produce from them um, will only encourage these bugs to come. So as soon as you're, you're past your prime with your vegetables, pull them and plant something else. And we're back to these lovely creatures. The one on the left is the tomato hornworm and it is way more colorful than the tobacco hornworm but you can have both um, on your plants so if you see them what i tend to do is i cut off the branch that they're on and throw it outside of the garden so that the birds have a nice tidbit to munch on and then I just try to go through and make sure that I get them on a daily basis so that they don't destroy the plants totally. Um, I, again you could put them in soapy water. Um, there's a few guys around our garden that just like to squish them, but that's a little bit too much for me. I guess I'm just a weakling when it comes to squishy bugs. But if you have either of these, you really want to be diligent and get them off your tomatoes or you will have no produce. This year, we had a, found a new bug in our garden and so I thought I would tell you about it. It's called a flea beetle and it overwinters in trees or in um, like tree clippings and that kind of thing. And there's many species of them and some of them are dark with the yellow stripes that you see. Some are green. Um, we've had the one on the bottom right, the real shiny one, and the striped one in our garden this year. And we believe it's because we brought in a lot of wood chips and that they had overwintered in the trees before they were um, cut and, and chipped. So we got a bunch of these. They devour your coal crops. Um, they just, we had a lot of flowers destroyed. They really love broccoli. They love radishes. And they're really, really fast. They get their name from the fact that they jump off of the leaves when they see you coming. And so it's really hard to catch them. But the interesting thing is that they come out when you're first thinking about putting seedlings in the ground when the temperature reaches about 50 degrees and they lay their eggs at the bottom of your plant and the larvae feed on the roots. And so if you can delay planting your um, bugs 
or your seedlings for a couple of weeks till the temperature gets warmer, you won't have the same problem. They are almost always fatal to seedlings because they eat the roots and they eat the leaves. But if you have stronger, more mature plants, um, they usually don't do enough damage to hurt them. But you know you have them if your plants look like somebody has come along and shot it with a shotgun. It's full of shot holes. And for the larger plants, there's enough leaves that they can continue on and keep growing. But the little ones, once they have their roots eaten, they're really, really hard to get rid of. And we put down sticky tape to catch them with. We put, they're repelled by basil, but they're attracted to nasturtiums and radishes. So you could plant a nasturtium or a radish and away from your other seedlings and they will go to those and then you can, can kill them there. They're very hard to kill. We've used alcohol and soapy water as um, the almanac says. And we've gone after some other Omni certified um, pest control, but it is, they just don't die as quickly as you would like them to. So in conclusion, the things that I hope you can take away from this um, talk is that keep your garden free of debris. Maintain healthy plants. Once they're past their prime, get rid of them and plant something new. Recognize the bad bugs, especially when they look similar like ladybugs and the Mexican bean beetle, and manually remove your bugs before you use any organic pest control because our gardens need to be healthy and they have to have a good balance of the good and bad bugs um, as well as balanced soil to give you the kind of harvest that you, you want to realize from your garden. That's it, Chris. Hey, that was great. And lots of pictures like you said, you know, you got into all those different insects that you guys have to fight with and what you do about them. So um, like your little owl there for questions. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, I have got, I'm gonna put up right now, um, the form for the, the evaluation link. So go to your chat box and let me see if I can get this to go for me here. Come on. There it goes. This is where we, we and, um, and so if you could just open up that uh, evaluation survey, just, just, Save it till the end of the meeting or do it now, you know, just, you know, because we're still we're still talking here. And at this time, I'm going to start inviting people to um, answer to to ask their questions. And so McFarland was first. So McFarland, I'm giving you the ability to um, open your microphone. Matter of fact, I'm going to unmute you. Well, you're going to unmute yourself. And And I'm gonna go ahead and ask the question I'll, in, in, in case you're unable, there you go. Okay, McFarland, you're up about the bee houses. Okay, so um, how do you clean the bee houses? Also, when do you clean them was the question. Um, you can clean the bee houses just by pulling their, um, the nesting material out of them. And you usually clean them in the fall so that they have a clean place to go in the spring. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lenny had the next question. And again, about the bees. 
So Lenny, if you're able to unmute yourself, I'll let you ask, ask the question about orchard mason bees. I, I, I was looking at the bumblebees I get, and we've got the small bees, but I, I've never seen anything that looks quite like that orchard mason. Is, it, is that a common bee, or were you just talking in general about bees? No, it's a common bee that you will find around the gardens. And um, if you want to bring them in, you can get them on the internet and release them in your garden. But we've had those kinds of bees in our, our garden for probably six years. We're just trying to entice more because they're such good pollinators. And unlike honeybees, they don't get mad at you and sting you. Uh, yeah, a friend of ours has, has had two two groups of bees that he brought in. I think he said they were Africanized, mm -hmm. uh, and so they had to to eliminate them. Right? I'm a little cautious about bringing bees in, but right. Well, for, for you us. know, if you if you go for the uh, mason bees, um, we've not had any problem with them at all, and uh -huh. you know, we've got a hundred um 100 or so gardeners and gardens and nobody's been bit yet and if i could add something lenny i do believe that those mason bees uh, are in globe there's no reason they shouldn't be here so if you create some of that habitat that they're talking about you know a bee house you may be able to uh encourage them to come into your garden there are and a little bit about those mason bees there are dozens if not more solitary native bees that live in that live in that are just you know native to arizona yeah. and so yeah. if we're able to encourage them to participate in our gardens that's it's all good and they're yeah, not we'll, yeah oh yeah i was going to say we have we have uh, uh some big black bumblebees this year that we haven't had before but we've got those smaller smaller bees that live in the in the bushes around that you know around the property yeah, and those bumblebees. Yeah, you don't want to get stung by one of those, but uh, no. they, they're not they're not honeybees, so a little no. little easier to get along with. Yeah. Okay, um, Joe, we've got you up next. And so Joe is asking, which type of mulch is good to use? in the garden to reduce bad bugs. So anything about mulching? Um, we use either straw or I happen to use wood shavings on mine. Um, you can also use just composted manures or anything like that. The one thing that um, the mulch does is like the potato beetle once it um it likes to go down there to stay cool and hide but because i've got mulch on there my beneficial bugs that are going to um get rid of that beetle for me are also underneath there so we use um just about any type of organic type um mulch okay good um the next question i've got a q a here again from mcfarland who tells me um doesn't have a microphone so the question is how oh it, it was the same question how do you clean the bee houses okay mm -hmm. so we got that good all right next up um sage so let me see if i can get sage up here Sage, if you want to, there you go. Oh, yes. Sage is all okay. set to go. Good work. <laughs> um, my question was: Are aphids the same as white flies? Because we've got a terrible problem with white flies in our garden. Uh, Chris, that one's for you. I don't know the answer. Aphids and white flies are two different species. Um, both are good to hit with a strong stream of water and a little, maybe a little soap to to, to knock them down, but. Mostly when you're dealing with aphids there, then the, the uh, larvae stage, they're wingless. 
um, while your white fly, whole nother, really, it, it's actually a fly. Um, they're they're pretty hard to keep under control. So just do do. Um, have you you haven't had white fly issues up there, Susan? I have not that I know of. Okay. We have plenty of aphids, but not the white flies. And uh, I know I've got several of my colleagues on the call here. So if they've got some advice on uh, on white flies, go ahead and put your type into the Zoom the, the the chat box, and I'll I'll promote you there to provide an answer. But I'm going to say, in the meantime, you know, if we want to stay away from uh, pesticides. Hit, hit them with that soapy water, with a, not soapy, but just strong, uh, a stream of stream of water. Okay, uh, my, uh, we also have a lot of wasps and we didn't really cover that. Wasps, um, boy, there are so many different species of wasps. Many of them are considered beneficials. Um, there are certain types of wasps that use other insect bodies to lay their eggs in and there's parasitic, which are good ones for us. So is there a particular wasp that you're um, dealing with? Um, it's like a gold colored wasp. And then we also have another wasp that has um, like a red butt and it seems to nest in the ground. Mm -hmm. And we also have um, another wasp that has a black butt, but like yellow body. And are you seeing their homes? Are they the typical, what they call paper wasp or mud daubers? Like you said, the ones are living actually in the ground. So that's a little different. Um, so they tend, to, the gold wasps tend to be on my corn. And I haven't found where their home is. The wasp with the red butt, it was living in a hole in the ground. And then the black or the wasp with the yellow body and black butt, we do not know, but it's coming and usually hanging out on my passion vine. Now the red, the one with the red abdomen or butt, is it a pretty good sized wasp that's black and has the red abdomen? Yes, I would say probably maybe like, you know, a good inch and yeah. more, maybe inch and a half. That, that one I recognize is what we call the tarantula hawk. And yeah. they live in the ground. They, just like I said, they parasitize, they, 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 they sting a, uh, a tarantula, they bring it into its, its cage, its hole there, and they lay their eggs in there, and that's what the young feed on. Um, I would not, I don't bother those. And they do have a really mean sting. You don't want to, get stung by them, but uh, if you give them some respect, they won't bother you. The um, other ones, just how, how aggressive are they? Have you been getting stung? Are you, are, I mean, what's, what's going on? Um, we give them pretty wide space. I've just kind of been staying out of the parts of the garden that they're in. Um, mm -hmm. Like if they're there, I'm leaving. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, I'm not a, a bug enthusiast of any kind. Right. Sage, um, I think in, in my uh, announcement, I have my email address, ckjones at arizona.edu. Maybe we could follow this up. I can get you some more information on those other wasps. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, great. Okay. So next up, uh, Don has a question here, Don Alabama. Well, he, Don, you asked about the, uh, the white flies. So have you got anything to share about the, those? Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm just not familiar with uh, the organic way of controlling them, but uh, white flies are normally, uh, they have, uh, they bring with them a virus disease and especially in tomatoes, they could cause the uh, tomato yellow leaf curl virus. And the thing with the, vi uh, the leaf curl virus is the symptoms appear like two weeks after the first infestation or, yeah. So uh, the problem lies there because 
when you see the symptoms, it's already too late. So it's good to monitor the presence of white flies. Uh, they usually, uh, you can find them underneath the leaves and uh, control them uh, as, as soon as possible. Uh, I'm familiar with uh, pesticide control because that's how we control them in, in ag. So uh, there's then a group of insecticides called neonicotinoids. Uh, they could kill bees, but if you uh, apply them on the ground, then it, uh, because it's a systemic insecticide, so it could be absorbed by the plants and could minimize uh, toxicity to bees. Uh, so, but I'm not very much familiar with uh, the organic control of it. That's why I was asking. Yeah, I'm, I'm not either. And uh, the, the, the fun thing about Susan and their experience at the Payson Community Garden is when they get uh, a new insect in the garden, they learn how to deal with it. Just like you said, yeah. flea beetles weren't a problem. The squash bugs have been a nemesis for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so we, we are learning as we go. But um, let's put that into that uh, evaluation link as a suggestion. And I could probably get some more, some more information on white flies, talk with our colleagues on campus. Um, Chris, mm -hmm. we tend to protect our um, tomatoes for sure by as soon as we plant them, put a netting or like tool over them that keeps the um, flies that cause the um, curly leaf disease and that kind of stuff off of them. So we do that early on. So if you go by the garden, you'll see all kinds of curl, colored tool and stuff like that. But that is one way to help prevent that. And, and using that type of um, reme or, or, or cloth that, you know, creates a kind of a full cover. I mean, not, if it's got any holes, I mean, white flies are pretty tiny. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks, Don. Anything else on that? Uh, that's, that's it. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to go to um, Sophia now. And Sophia, you can unmute and ask your question. Go ahead. Okay. I love the praying mantis. In fact, I had purchased some online and the eggs and, uh, but I heard that they may be killing hummingbirds. Is this correct? I have not heard that. Sophia, I think that's something that would be extremely rare where you have a very large praying mantis and it ends up on YouTube and you see the fight. Um, <laughs> but I think it's something that typically um, that's a very rare event. So, um, oh, okay. Okay, because I, I worried really uh, quite a bit about that. Because I, I have a ton of hummingbirds that come by. Oh yeah, yeah and I mean, those and those praying mantis. I mean, they're gonna grab whatever gets close enough to them. So <laughs> <laughs> the the hummingbird uh, aware, but it's like that hummingbird moth. I think they can catch yeah. one of those too. You know, uh -huh. they're strong. They're strong insects, and mm -hmm. but but um, but I'd say that's a a novelty if you're seeing that. It's not really not going to happen in your garden, but I'm not saying it can't happen. Yeah, I have not seen it. However, I saw a video of the praying mantis underneath a feeder uh -huh. and then it was it was eating away at the hummingbird oh, oh, the me. i know uh -huh. yeah we oh. we see terrible yeah. things on youtube <laughs> we do <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. okay so i responded back to sage here there's my email address and the next question here susan has a question so let me get Susan up. And she's asking about identifying bugs. So go ahead, Susan. Okay, so um, I have issues where I find little holes in the plants, but every time I go out and look, I'm not seeing anything. So I'm not sure what kind of bug it is. Is there a time during the day that might be best to see who they are or what they are? We usually find them mostly 
first thing in the morning when it's cooler out, when they can get on the leaves. Um, but we have a lot of, um, you know, the ants can eat holes in your leaves. Um, the beetles can eat holes in your leaves. So it's, it's kind of hard unless you can see one to know exactly what you have in your garden that um, is putting holes in your plants. And, okay, thank you. And Susan, you know, insects have different types of mouth parts. So, you know, when mm -hmm. you're seeing that type of chewing, you know it's uh, a, a, you know, a, a grasshopper or a, or a larvae or something that has that chewing mouth part. Um, and oftentimes, try getting out there at dusk and at dawn and seeing if that's sometime you might be able to see them. And Susan was mentioning earlier about using a, a black light. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and again, just kind of this idea of being able to put those row covers to kind of hold, keep, keep these insects off is often a good, good solution too. Okay. okay. Thank you. Whoops, let me get that back down here. Next question is from Francis Peter. So I've got you up there for question about grasshoppers. Yes, um, I've had a lot of grasshoppers on my lantana and I can't seem to control it, control them. <laughs> <laughs> Any ideas, Susan? I have no idea because we get a few on our, um, in our garden, but not a lot. Um, I don't know what exactly other than a pesticide that you could use on them. They and just again, skip the leaves. <laughs> um, I'll go ahead and you know ask for any of my colleagues to help chime in and, and help with this answer. But um, one thing that I think with grasshoppers, it they're they're just so hard because you know they they hop and um, <laughs> oftentimes their populations aren't so big. So so. Sophia responded back saying chickens will eat the grasshoppers. So I don't know if you're able to cap chickens. Yeah, they, they like to chase them down and eat them. Um, one thing that may or may not make a difference, uh, a lot of gardeners like um, diet, diatomaceous earth. Mm -hmm. And if you set that, you know, just sprinkle that around your um, lantana plants. If they get on the ground, if that, um, diatomaceous earth is able to scratch it all at their exoskeleton, at their legs or body, you know, that would take them down. And I've got Amy Nichol saying nolobate is BT for grasshoppers. So you may want to um, look up nolo uh, and how, you know, how it works and what, how we're able to do it. So, so, uh, are you guys able to see that chat box? Uh huh. Okay. I am. So so yeah, Amy and some other people are suggesting you to use a a Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, a BT that's called Nolo. That's great. Thank you very much. Very good. And and Jan Groth says Simaspore is also good long term control for um, grasshoppers. Sinister. I'm so grateful I've got my friends here with us to help us, oh, Susan, because when absolutely. it comes to bugs, you know what you know and you don't know what you don't know. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and I am learning so much about this. So that's great. <laughs> okay. Oh, and the other good thing with um, Simispore is it's carried by Arbico Organics. And Arbico is a company right there in like Oro Valley. So, good, so it's nice to support a an Arizona company. Mm -hmm. I know Ar Arbico. Great. Okay, so I've got the, um, oh, and she says it's the trade name for, for NOLO, so same, same BT. All right, so um, I'm going to, and we can still take some questions, but I'm gonna take over the screen here. Dun, dun, dun. Come on, let me, oh, I already have, yeah. And I'm going to pull my slides up here. I've got to look around my camera. 
there's there's Susan. So thank you so much. If we, I wish we had these response ones that we could give a little clap a hand or something. So <laughs> very grateful for it. I'm um, very happy to bring what I know and share because, as you said, it's a learning experience even for the people that are teaching. And um, so that webinar evaluation, I can put that in the chat box again, but um, basically if you've received that once, you're filling it out, just helps me to um, just make this a better event for people. And just a plug for next week, Thursday, July 23rd at 11 a.m., we've got Bill Cook, who's the Master Gardener Coordinator for University of Arizona in Greenlee County. And Bill's gonna talk about container gardening. And those of you who know Bill know he's just a lot of fun to be around and just an excellent speaker on this. So please do join us um, for, for that. I'm gonna open the chat again here. Um, got to get out of full screen. I guess I, I guess I'm stuck in full screen as long as I'm sharing. Okay. And I'm going to get that evaluation one more time. Stick it in the chat box. And so if you missed that earlier, I really appreciate you taking the time to fill that out. Uh, unless we've got some more questions, I'm gonna wind this down here. So thank you so much, Susan. Thank you so much, everybody who joined us today. Uh, just put this back up as our closing slide, so get you excited about next week. And please do go to our um, website at extension.arizona.edu slash Gila. You can find the, the archive recordings. And, and thank you so much. Uh, I'll shut this down. Anything else you want to share, Susan? I'm, I'm good. Just if you want to come out to the garden and see what we're doing, um, come on out and join us. And there's always somebody there to answer questions. And periodically, we steal Chris and have him come out and help us too. So. All right. Well, um, I'm going to turn off the recording.